All right, everybody. Hey, our, our next guest here on Note Camp uh, is a rock star. And I mean that just not the fact that she loves music and is a kick-ass singer and all that good stuff, but she is a rock star when it comes to her niche of real estate investing. She's a real estate broker, but more importantly, I like to call her the short-term rental queen. She's the author. <laughs> <laughs> She's the author of Short-Term Rentals, Long-Term Wealth. It's a Bigger Pockets book. But probably the premier expert in uh, Airbnb short-term rentals, the one, the only, Avery Carl. What's going on, Avery? How's it going this morning? Oh, going pretty good. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. Now, one of the things, it, I, I imagine so, talk a little bit how you got into what you're doing now. You want to start at the beginning, kind of how you fell into short-term rentals? Sure, sure. So uh, kind of by accident, I think like most people that end up in real estate investing, um, we moved to Nashville from New York City, uh, probably that was in 20, lo longer ago than I would like to admit. <laughs> and um, our, I didn't have my license at the time I was working in the music business. And our agent said, Oh, you really want to buy in this super hipster area of Nashville, the home values are appreciating really quickly. Let's get you in over here. We were like, mm, no, we just came from Brooklyn. We don't really want neighbors. We want to buy something out in the country. So we did. And then we thought, well, maybe we should buy one of those too. We have a little money left, see if it appreciates. And you know, that was dumb. You don't invest solely on appreciation. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, luckily that one, I still have that one. We're about to 1031 exchange that into a 26 unit apartment building. Thank you. Appreciation cherry on top though, <laughs> cash flow first. Um, but when, once we got the first rent check on that one, we thought, oh, we need more of these. We actually want to make this a business. So then we started educating ourselves. Most people educate themselves first and then make a huge purchase, but we did the opposite. So we started educating ourselves, reading the books, listening to the podcast, and we had just one down payment worth of capital left for a single family home. And we thought, well, what can we buy that's going to make us the most amount of money so that we can go buy more of these faster? We landed on short-term rentals, did not want to do it in Nashville. Nashville is not a good spot for short-term rentals. So we thought, well, where can we go that we don't have to really worry about regulations that this is what people do is they come rent houses and not hotels. So we bought in the Smoky Mountains, which is about three hours east of Nashville. And again, didn't really have any mentorship or guidance or know anyone that was doing it. We just did it, figured out how to do it remotely without having to pay a property manager because the average property management fees, 25% of your gross, uh, Long story short, that went really well, scaled that into five within about a year and a half with some different creative financing tools. And along the way, I started a short-term shop because, which is a real estate agency that focuses exclusively on working with short-term rental clients. And uh, there were really no agents when I, back when I first started shopping that could answer any questions about return on investment or remote management or any of that stuff. So we just filled that gap, became those agents. Now we operate in six markets in four states with more to come. And that's what we do. Now, let's talk about that because it's a, a lot of people uh, have had uh, peaks and valleys, I guess you could be the best way. They've had really good stuff or the COVID kind of hurt them in some, some sort of fashion. How is your stuff positioned with everything that happened in the last 12 months? And were you book solid or did you have some, you know, some low spots? Great question. So I will preface this with, so I have 57 doors right now. Uh, eight of them are short-term rentals. So I'm not advocating to buy only short-term rentals and that's the right and only way to go. There's a lot to be said for the very tried and true long-term single family, multifamily route. Uh, so it's never been my goal to have all short-term rentals, but the short-term rentals kind of act as a cash flow turbocharger in any portfolio. So just getting to your question now. Um, we were at when COVID first hit last year, we were like, oh crap. There goes short terms, but good thing we've got all these long terms. We don't have to worry about it because we're diverse. Uh, turns out it was the exact opposite. So the short terms were shut down for two or three weeks. And then it was like a tidal wave of guests that came back. We were making more money than we ever have on them. And it was already great money, but we're getting higher prices per night than we've ever seen. Um, it's still nuts. But then it was like, oh, well, eviction moratorium. Guess we have to worry about that on our long term. So it was actually the opposite of what you would expect, but I think we had a different experience than a lot of short-term rental investors because of the markets that we invest in. So uh, we don't do metro markets. We don't do big fly to markets. We invest in short terms only in regional drivable vacation rental markets. So 
because all these people have been cooped up in their houses, but they didn't want to go to big cities and they also did not want to go on planes, but they would drive somewhere, we really, really saw a boom in our markets. And that ha has been proof positive of our strategy from the get go that the regional drivable market is the way to go. Is there a, a kind of a, a short checklist or a couple of things that you look at when evaluating a market or evaluating a property? Probably a little bit different for both. Obviously, if it's within drivable distance, two to three hours of a major stuff, uh, what are some of the things that you look at, kind of the, your, your, your short checklist for you on that? So it has to be a place that the majority of the accommodations are short-term rentals. And it's been like that since before the internet. So Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, uh, the Emerald Coast in Florida. So that's like Destin, Panama City Beach area, Gulf Shores, Alabama, Blue Ridge, Georgia. These are not places that people go and stay in hotels. These are places that people have always gone and either rented a cabin or rented a beach house. Uh, you can kind of, I mean, if you're trying to thought without, I mean, you can totally get on Google and just say best places to invest in short-term rentals. But if you want to come to the idea independently, just think of a place you went with your parents growing up where you rented a house, hotel. And those are the types of places that we that we like to stick to. We don't, we don't love for there to be a lot of industry outside of tourism because those, those places, I call them mature vacation rental markets where people have been staying in those houses and condos for decades. Uh, the regulations are very, very established. They established them long ago. The cities and counties are making great money and it would be way too detrimental to the local economy for them to regulate against it. What you don't want to do is go into a market that, you know, has has a good amount of tourism, you know, has all the other check boxes, but has no regulations because the regulations are coming. You just don't know when. So you want one that has them, but very established regulations. That makes sense. Makes sense. Now, when you're looking at a property, uh, are you preferring, are you in your doors? Is it a mixture of one ones or three twos or bigger houses or small houses? What do you kind of see as an uh, ideal fit for what your, your target market is? So the highest return on investment is like in the four to six bedroom range. But in my current portfolio, just because of the way we start, like when we started, we bought what we could afford as soon as we could afford it. And I recommend doing that to make sure you don't wait yourself out of the game, because while you're waiting to save up a down payment, prices are just going up. So um, we have a one, one, one bedroom, two, two bedrooms, one, three bedroom, three, four bedrooms and one, five bedroom. So uh, we've got a little bit of everything. Nice, nice. Now, are you, what's, when you're looking at kind of what to expect to charge what are some of the things that you, you're looking at to determine your hourly your, or your nightly, not your hourly, right? It's not that type of thing. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? As far as a nightly rate. You're going to charge a little more for that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any tools that you're looking at to determine your, your nightly or daily rates? <laughs> so um, when I started, you had to do everything manually. You had to like at the beginning of the year or once a month, look at your next six months and adjust prices based on holidays and things that are happening times of year. Now there are lots of great tools to automate that for you. The one that we use is Price Labs. And um, you just set that up and it has an algorithm that measures what everybody else is charging, what's going on in the area uh, and peaks and, and lows and things like that. So you can go in there and adjust it. Like if you're not getting booked at all, maybe you want to adjust it a little bit lower, but for the most part, you can have, there's software that does all of that for you now. That makes sense. Cool. Now, when you see somebody is not getting booked, what are probably the top two or three things that you're seeing people screw up on to not get booked? Is it bad photos, bad location, not any close to amenities? What do you, what do you kind of see as a secret sauce to getting booked? Uh, your pro photos really do make a difference. There's no excuse not to get pro photos. I mean, it's a few hundred bucks maybe to get done. The photos are what's going to get you clicks and people are going to click through the photos before they even read your description. So if they fall in love with those, you have a, be a better chance of getting booked. Uh, high, uh, prices being too high is pro probably more so than photos. Cause if they see a price, they're just probably going to keep scrolling. Uh, and then really just poor, I mean, 
there's not a specific thing, but I would just say like poor management in general, because you are rewarded for responding quickly and having good reviews with being put higher in the search rankings. So you could have a beautiful property with beautiful pictures, but if you're not being responsive and managing it well, nobody's ever going to see it because it'll be too far back in the search results. Mm, it makes sense. Um, somebody just asked me a question about management fees. You mentioned 25% mm -hmm. management fees when you got started. What, what's the normal management fee? I mean, are you doing a lot yourself, automation, local you know, property management services? What are you, what are you kind of seeing? So we do not use property managers. We don't recommend using property managers just because they suck a lot of cash flow out of the deal. 25% is the norm. It, when I started, it was 40%. Wow. Uh, but 25% is kind of the average industry standard right now. And the only thing that a property manager can do for you in short term uh, in 2021 that you can't do from your iPhone is just suck all the cash flow out of the deal. So what we do at the short term <laughs> shop is uh, so for anybody who buys a property with us, we teach them how to manage it remotely for free so that they can then be successful and then hopefully buy more with us. But you know, every our their success and our success, you know, what's the phrase? Um, a rising tide raises all the ships. So it's our goal to make you as successful as possible. So you'll come back and buy more with us. I love it. I love it. Now, uh, somebody asked me the other day about horror stories. You got any horror stories when it comes to uh, any short term, your short term tenants, short term rentals? Uh, we haven't had, we've only had, we haven't had anybody like tear anything up or destroy anything. We've had just a few idiots. Uh, <laughs> we had one guy who, we have a cabin in the Smoky Mountains. It's in a, it's in a subdivision. It's not like off in the wilderness. Like everything's paved and you can't necessarily see the next cabin over, but you can hear them like shut their car door. And we had one family stay there and the guy was so terrified. And it's, you know, a big A-frame with tons of windows. He was terrified that a bear was going to be like walking along his merry way and just decide to punch through the window and come eat them. And he gave us a one-star review for that. Oh because, and then the way the cabin was laid out, if a bear were to break in, you would most certainly die, is what he mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <good> <laughs> yeah. There's one board every day, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's kind of one of those one-star reviews that you want because you, you, it's not a four star review or three star review is actually worse than a one star because typically the one stars are going to be the total Karens that like misspell everything and you can tell they're it was them not you. So it's all right to have like a one star once in a blue moon just to make you look like a real person. But yeah, that was definitely a good one. <laughs> what is, what, uh, that's a funny one. Now let's flip the other side. What's one of the things you hear the most about? Uh, as far as compliments wise, or people mentioned they really enjoyed with, with your stuff. Is there anything that just kind of pops up a little bit on a regular basis? Um, so none of our stuff is anything like spectacular. They're all like nice places to sure. stay. Some of them have pools. They're all really clean. Uh, we make sure that, you know, that's a big thing with anybody or it should be with anybody anyway. And uh, so, but we don't have any like crazy murals or anything for people to take pictures in front of. We just give them a nice, place to stay. It, our beach markets close to the beach, mountain markets, they're nice private areas. And um, they've been, they, they've, they've been rocking and rolling. <laughs> no bears, no, no bears to take a photo of, right? <laughs> Sometimes there are. Sometimes we'll see them on the ring cams, but. But they're not punching and eating anybody, killing anybody. That's a funny thing. No, they're black bears. They're just little, like they're little bears. Yeah. No, just, bears. It's right, not like right. the revenant in, <laughs> in the smoke. Now, are there, are there limitations a lot of times that you see in it that you recommend, like no pets or no animals or maximum amount of people staying over, no parties? What are some of the, maybe the rules that you, you put towards uh, your stuff that are, are good practices, best practices? We definitely say no parties or events. Uh, I really badly wanted to be pet friendly when we started because I am that person that brings home rescue dogs like weekly that sleep in the bed with us. And um, I wanted to be able to be that person. And it just, you know, maybe two or three times of somebody bringing a big hairy dog that it, big hairy white dog, where it took our cleaners like hours to unweave all the hairs out of everything that we were just like, eh, I don't think we can do this. And plus uh, I know when I bring my dogs and I walk into a house, I can't always smell whatever dog was there before. 
I'm fine with that because I'm a dog owner, but the people who aren't, they're not going to be fine with that. So we are not dog friendly because it's just too much of a hassle. Uh, we, and there's two schools of thought on the amount of people that you want to fit in a property. We only let like two more than the number of beds we have. So two per bedroom and then plus two, uh, because we don't like to cram a lot of people into a house. Uh, that's when you get the partiers and things like that. If people are coming for, to use it for good and not for evil, a bunch of adults, you know, they don't want to be sleeping in the same room together, listening no. to each other, breathe all night. They want their own private room. Uh, so I don't, we don't like that. And then also if they're not comfortable, if they feel crowded from the get-go, they might be more, more sensitive to other things during their stay that they might mention in your review that they would not have been, had they just been comfortable, but there are investors out there that he, the number of heads and beds they can get is priority number one. And they would tell me I'm leaving a, a lot of money on the table. I would tell them they're doing more repairs than I'm having to do. And they're getting worse guests and worse reviews to have to manage because of the way they're managing it. So that's mm -hmm. how we do it. Right. Now, how do you handle the repairs when it comes to, obviously you're probably taking deposits down for people and you've got credit cards on file, but uh, any major repairs that you see happening or stuff to, to watch out for, th or maybe things removed from a house that doesn't cause them getting broke too much? Uh, I mean, stuff's going to get broken. You know, I, I try to minimize knickknacks and just have like some nice art on the walls and not a bunch of stuff everywhere because that stuff is going to get knocked over. It's going to get broken. Uh, major repairs. I do recommend just visiting your property like once a year and just looking and making sure it doesn't need any repairs. Um, but yeah, we really haven't had anybody damaged it. We had one person break a door one time and they even said they were like, Oh, sorry. <laughs> and that was it. And it just, the stuff that has happened is oftentimes so cheap, you know, a few hundred bucks that it's not worth trying to go through the whole process of trying to file a claim with Airbnb. And you have to do that before the next guest checks in, by the way, which means mm. the first guest is not going to have left you a review at the time that you're doing this. So you're going to, you know, is it, you have to weigh, do I need this 200 bucks or do I want this bad review and just go about it that way? Mm, that makes a lot of sense there for you and all about time in there for you. Airbnb, pretty easy to work with? Uh, VRBO is definitely much more host centric. Airbnb is really more geared towards the guests. So any dispute, you can pretty much expect them to go with the guest, even if it's their first Airbnb stay and you have 17 properties on the platform and you've made them a million dollars this year there, you can pretty much expect them to side with the guests on everything. So if you just know that going in and don't expect anybody to really have your back except yourself, then you're going to be all right. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Now, when you're uh, buying properties and stuff like that, have you, have you started looking at some newer markets? Or you, mm -hmm. I mean, you have your reliable stuff, but what's some of the new markets maybe that you're, you're looking at exploring or diving into a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we just closed on one in the Forgotten Coast of Florida, which is our newest market that we have a sales office, actually, which is it's just to the east of Panama City Beach. So it's in the Florida Panhandle. The towns there are Mexico Beach, Cape San Blas, Port St. Joe, St. George Island. Uh, we bought a place on Cape San Blas right on the beach. There's like one house on the sand in front of us and then ours is the second one back. And um, a lot of the tourism is moving from Destin, 30A, Panama City, because it's so, so, so crowded. That's, that's where I live right now. Uh, it's, it gets so crowded here in the summer that a lot of the older school, uh, like people that have been coming here for 10, 20 years, don't like that because it used to not be crowded here. So a lot of those people are scooting over east to the beaches that are a little more quiet. So that would be Cape San Blas and St. George Island. So we just bought one there. It's we're do it's a value add. We're adding another bedroom and another bathroom. That's not done yet, but uh, that's that's my favorite market at the moment. I like it. Nice. Now, uh, is there a you know a lot of people that are landlords they look at the one percent multiplier. You know, is there a, a ratio that you guys look at with your rentals? Hmm. Not really, because everything. What you're making in a month in the summer is going to be different than what you're making in a month in the winter, depending on what market it is or vice versa. So we just kind of look at it annual cash on cash return. Yeah. That makes sense. And you're always looking for a pretty good return on that. Any, any averages you want to give out what you're looking for? 
20% at least. And you can, I mean, we do quite a bit better than that on a lot of ours, but 20% is kind of the benchmark. It makes sense. That makes sense there for you. Now, are you, uh, have you been the, uh, the short-term expert that you are and then training people, what's the big, what's one thing that you're talking with people about maybe is a uh, myth or something they think about that you basically like, no, that's not true. What's one thing you hear is a misconception a lot of times about short-term rentals? That you have to live in the town or live close to the property. And how, how, and obviously with the software and the things you're doing, that absolutely takes away that obviously. I mean, it's like, it's a 21st century. I mean, you're, people are buying real estate all across the country, uh, yeah. you know, versus having to go touch it and knock on it and, and be a helicopter landlords, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about it, there is really not ever an appropriate situation that could be happening with a guest or with the property with a guest in it that you need to go involve yourself. <laughs> so. That's a good question. That's where you have your handyman, your clean clue, or the police that needs things. Yes. Be done. Um, now, when, you, when you're buying in different areas, are you, uh, and this is just a question, are you communicating with the neighbors? Are, are you, are, have you got any backlash from buying properties and turning them into short-term rentals in, in communities where maybe you don't see a lot of that by any chance or no? Well, with the markets that we operate in, pretty much all of the communities have been developed specifically to be short-term rentals. So we don't really go into places where you're having to deal with, with neighbors. I mean, the little, the neighborhood that I live in, like, no, but I don't want anybody to know who I am in this neighborhood because there's nobody that there's no HOA, but nobody really short-term rents, but two have moved in down the street. And I mean, I'm the first one to be like, you're not going to short-term rent that, are you? <laughs> Uh, so you want to try to stay out of neighborhoods that, you know, don't have a lot of rentals in them just because that can cause, like, I mean, I would never vote on anything that says you can't short-term rent here if they did want to make an HOA just because it would kill my property value. But, uh, I certainly don't want like people party, you know, we got little kids and stuff. So, um, it is what it is. You, you, you got to kind of keep it separate. Mm hmm um, here in Austin, Texas, they, the city outlawed short-term rentals inside the city limits of Austin, Texas. And a lot of people were using that, especially around South by Southwest and ACL and things like that. And uh, the city actually hired three organizations to go around and check people that are violating that. So it's wow. been, been an interesting time here in Austin because a lot of people were using that to make extra money during you know, the weekends and with people traveling in to visit and all the things here. But now, but that's been shut down. Um, yeah, are you, are you, have you heard of any other any other places like that in the country running into stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, it's always almost always in metro markets, Nashville's like that. Like we had an office in Nashville for a while, and after like our third or fourth client was in a lawsuit with the city and a developer, we we're like, we're just not gonna. This is not worth doing um, because what would happen is they would buy these pre-construction Airbnb properties that you know at a big premium. Mm -hmm. And at the time that they got under contract, it would be legal. And then over the course of the year, it takes for it to be built. All these battles have happened. And then all of a sudden they can't use that asset for what they thought they could before they've even closed. And it just became a big mess. So that's why we don't mess with Metro markets. Uh, typically it's just, makes, it's too much. Makes sense there. Now are when, so, uh, with us, with so many investors going on the rental side, or also us buying debt and taking property back there for you, uh, you're, I imagine you said you're adding a bedroom, adding a bath and one spot there for you. When you buy a property and it's the right number of bedrooms, what kind of, you know, obviously rehab varies on an asset by asset class. Have you bought properties that need a lot of work that you rehabbed up or have you bought clean new built properties that were ready to rock and roll? What's kind of your, your model that you like or that you've taught or worked with investors on? I've done both. Uh, I don't recommend going the rehab route unless you're kind of experienced with that, especially from a distance. But uh, we have done both. Uh, I think we've done, I think we've done maybe three full rehabs and then several, however many else, you know, whatever's left over. I don't like to do math uh, in, in turnkey properties. So it's, um, I just buy whatever the, whatever the deal is. What makes but sense. we did one over here in Destin. We bought it for six fifty. It was a four bedroom with a pool. We put fifty into it. It was worth eight fifty when we finished, and it's now worth about one point four. So that's probably my like my big fish story. <laughs> of doing now, how, now how that that's a that's a big investment there for yeah. uh, how, how many bedrooms is it? 
uh, four bedrooms and it's three blocks off the beach. It's a big four bedroom. It's like 3,500 square feet, but it's three blocks off the beach, has a private pool, no HOA. And it's, uh, it's really cute. It's so it was foreclosed on twice. Uh, first it was foreclosed on from just an individual. And then it was bought by like, um, a fund of some sort. And they got through the whole, it, they thought it was just going to be like a lipstick rehab, but turns out the entire back half of the house was rotted because they didn't put the decks on right and the, the top balconies. And so they got the outside done really, really cute. And then they ran out of money. So they're like, we'll just list it. And so for me, tr- for me, it truly was just the cosmetic, you know, floors, bathrooms, kitchen, and that's it, paint. Nice. And how's yeah. that? What's that rent for a night? I know it varies out of the season, but what kind of average rent rates are you getting on that one? That one, about 900 a night. Wow. It's, nice. it's a big, nice, like, beach house. Mm-hmm. Now, is there uh, any, do you, when you look at your rentals and something like that, are there any things different that you do marketing besides listening on, on the website or you do any type of, like, seasonal event marketing and stuff like that to, when something's going on in an area? There are a lot of people who do that. So we just put it on Airbnb and Verbo. Those are the two biggest platforms. Those get us plenty booked to where we just don't complicate our lives with, with anything else. There's a big movement of short-term rental owners that are doing like book direct and building their own websites. But I've seen, and, and, you know, doing like Facebook ads and things like that, but it seems from what I've seen, and I'm sure there are some people that, that can correct me if I'm wrong here, not more than like 10% of their bookings are coming from direct, which to me is not worth my time. Right. It, it might be worth someone's, but it's not worth mine. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense there for, uh, as well. There for you. Now, with your property that you're 1031 exchanging into an apartment complex, are you going to run that as apartment complex as, as long-term rentals? Are you going to do leave a couple open for short terms? What's kind of your philosophy with that? Our multis are just straight up long-term with a property manager. Uh, so we, our strategy right now, I guess I can go into that, is uh, we're, we – buy a short term. If one if a good one pops up, we're not like necessarily on the hunt for anything, but if I see a good one, we'll probably get it. And then we have an, and that's really in any of the markets that we operate in. And then we have a market in the Southeast where we're constantly just picking off hundred, $120,000 houses and just holding on to those. And then in the Midwest, we're buying multis and the short terms are only in the vacation markets. The multis, those are only long-term. And then that other Southeastern market is all long-term single family. So we're doing a little bit of everything. Yeah. And you definitely have a, a broad price range there. So 120 to uh, houses to a million plus there for you. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So actually of the 50 doors that we have, so eight are short-term and the rest are long, but dollar value, it's about 50, 50. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's interesting. That's interesting because you hear people talk about all the time, Hey, focus on one niche there, own it until you own another one. Uh, Frank's is awesome on there. Yeah, it's, it's a great <laughs> breakdown there for you. And obviously you're buying the lower value stuff because it, it's it's not lower value. I mean, when you compare a $100,000 market to a, a million dollar market, it's different. You know, yeah. like buying in Austin, Minnesota is a lot different than buying in Austin, Texas price range. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's the great thing is you're that 120 on the average, you're, are you, with pricing being so high, are you buying at market or what are some of your tactics for finding Uh, You're looking for foreclosures or subject to deals or, you know, are you financing these all with traditional financing or or, or OPM? What's some of the strategies of that? So we have what is called a guidance line with a local bank. So um, I didn't actually know what that was until last year when they gave us one. But if they like your business model, they like your, your PFS, your personal financial statement, and you have enough of a track record. And we showed this bank, hey, this is what we're doing over here. We've done this many. This is what we'd like to do. Uh, And they said, okay, here's a million dollar guidance line. Let's do what you're going to do this year. We'll revisit it next year and see if you want to renew, if you need more. So we just built a really good relationship with a local bank and did it that way. Nice. That's that's really cool. Now, that's a local bank. It's not like a Bank of America Chase or something. Is that correct? Okay. Right. Great local relationships. That's one of the great things about smaller banks there, huh? Yeah, yeah. Now, um, when when finding assets, you get them financed, therefore, what, are the, what kind of LTV? Are they willing to finance up to 100%? Or are you still bringing in down payments, 5, 10, or when you're taking down a property? 
we, they would do a hundred percent, but we're still putting 20% down because I would like that to be as many assets as possible instead of like three or four paid off ones. Mm -hmm. So, or paid off quote. Uh, so we're doing it that way. We're, we're throwing some money in the deal too, because well, we want it to be a long-term relationship. Yeah. But paid off assets, that just ties up a ton of equity. They can't right. touch it. Too, right? Yeah. Yeah. See, and I, I think that's where some people disagree. Like some people would rather buy just a few things and pay them off. I don't like that. I would rather buy multiple things. And then at the point that, you know, maybe the market gets really crazy and you can't buy anything and you want to increase cash flow, then maybe pay something off. But I'm a fan of leverage myself. Yeah. Right. Now that, that makes my question. Have you seen some of the markets that you have your stuff in just get out price ridiculous with everything going on the last year? Yeah. So a lot of the short-term ones have gone up, but that I think would have happened anyway. Uh, Chattanooga were priced out of for, for long terms. Nashville doesn't make sense anymore. That, that one property that I'm 1031 exchanging right now is my last Nashville property. And um, yeah, it's the deals are still out there. You just kind of have to adjust. Like we found a new market and that they, the prices have not really appreciated or depreciated too much over the last 10 years. So we feel pretty good about that. What's your opinion about, about people running out just their bedrooms? Are you a, a fan of that for people getting started or you prefer hey, the whole house? Uh, I, in the markets that when the regional vacation markets or vacation markets altogether, that renting out the bedroom is probably not going to work. If you're like house hacking and you just want to rent out a bedroom to like get yourself going, get some cash flow going, I would say that's probably a good idea. Um, I personally would not because I watch a lot of true crime, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it can be a great way to to try and get, you, you got to get the ball rolling any way you can. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Not true crime. Uh, what's that noise? <laughs> uh, is it a bear? No, it's something else. The bear. Of a man. <laughs> Well, but that, yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty, I, I'm sure it's, not, it's a pretty common response there for a lot of people out there. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's, let's talk about the, the short-term shop. Now you work with people, you help them buy property. Talk a little bit about your training that goes along with, with what you're doing. Okay. So if you buy a property with us in the, at the short-term shop, so we're in six markets, I guess we'll go over that first. The Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, the Ridge, Georgia area. So anywhere in the North Georgia mountains, uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama, the Emerald Coast in Florida, so Destin, 30A, Panama City Beach, Forgotten Coast in Florida, which is Cape San Blas, Mexico Beach, Port St. Joe, St. George Island, and then the Disney market. And if you buy with us in any of those markets, just, you know, regular real estate agent stuff, then we have a whole back-end training program and support group where we will teach you everything that you need to know from setting up your Airbnb and Verbo listings to all the automation tools that you need to set up, helping you set those up all the way to helping you source your cleaners, handymen, vendors on the ground that you need. So basically by the time you close with us, you're ready to turn the key and make money. And then we're, we're we have a private Facebook group for our clients only. There's 3000 people in there. So there's a lot, you know, any question that you have or any scenario that you run across, you can just go on there and say, Hey, what do I do about this? And 20 other pe people who have been through it before will answer you. Nice. Now, speaking of the Disney market, let's talk about that a little bit that in, in around Orlando, I take it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In Orlando or are you kissing me or how far are you from roughly the parks? They're in Universal. So Kissimmee and Davenport are the most short-term rental friendly. So that's where we, most of our bread and butter is there. And that's a, for those that don't know, it's about a 20 minute drive from Davenport uh, to the main gate, if I remember correctly, correct? Something like that. No, I've, I've rented in Davenport before. That's really, I knew that. <laughs> rented a, uh, uh, Airbnb there for you. Now, did you see a lot of issues there with the parks? Obviously parks being shut down, struggled some things, but how's that, is that market a little bit different than what you see in other areas? So it is a little bit different than the other ones that we're in. And the, the, the parks did get shut down for a while. They seem to be back up and running business as usual. And the thing about the Disney market is you can just get into a property for so much less than all the other markets that we're in. Uh, like you cannot get into anything in the Smoky Mountains for 300,000 anymore. You can in Davenport and Kissimmee. So again, if you're somebody who just needs to get the ball rolling and you don't want to wait yourself out of being able to buy anything, that's a really great market to get started on. The returns are not as good as the Smokies, but they are good. It's good enough to get started and get some cash flow rolling in for sure. 
Yeah, because when you look at the cost of staying on property compared to a lot of, especially if you have families going there, you know, it, it can be pretty expensive, especially not everybody's, you have day, Disney Vacation Club and stuff like that that runs a lot of that stuff over that neck of the woods, but uh, on property, it, people like having the room. They like having a full fridge, especially if they got kids and stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm, private pools, the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. That, that's awesome there. Uh, now, with what you're doing in the markets, do you have properties right now that you're looking at that you've identified as good stuff? Are you helping people buy or that you're helping people go out and find their own? Or do you have like a list of kind of hot pocket leads for sale? So yes, uh, all of the above. So in vacation markets, it's not like long-term rentals where if it hits the MLS, it's probably not a good deal anymore. Uh, these are, since the majority of properties in those markets are either investments or second homes, people unload those at retail, like right on the MLS, well before it ever becomes a distressed property. Mm-hmm. So there's not as many distressed type things. There, there are some, it's not impossible. I've found them. We have plenty of clients who have done it too, but it's just not as much. And it's not a situation where if it hits the MLS and it's a bad deal. So we've got that going. Um, we have since we had a ton of past clients, I think we have sold over 500 properties this year. So that is 500 potential sellers that if you come to me and say, hey, for this, I can just email all of our past clients and say, they want to sell anybody want a 1031. We need this kind of response to, uh, and get that off market really, really quick. And then we also uh, work with a few developers that allow us to sell their developments exclusively to our clients. So you can't get them anywhere else, but the short-term shop, uh, just close my mom and dad on one, which may or may not have been a mistake. Cause my mom <laughs> is really high strung and obsessive over everything. Uh, and you know, if one person says like moves the fridge and finds dirt or something, she's going to be like, Oh, I hope you don't think bad of us. We're not those kind of people. Like she's going to flip out, but we're working on it with her. She, you know, she deserves cash flow too. So, um, <laughs> the proverbial yeah. holding mom's hand through everything, yes. right? <laughs> yes. Clutches pearls. Yeah. Was she, is she already an investor of some sort or just, no, no, oh. this is their first one. They've, they are total Dave Ramsey is both of them. And, uh, my dad's just letting her run it and she's a stress case. And it's, it's, I have a feeling it's going to be a long, long ride for us, but I'm hoping she will uh, get over her limiting beliefs and be, if she can do it, anybody can. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Exactly. From anywhere. Now you're seeing, you're putting 20% now. Are you seeing a lot of your clients, <clears throat> you know, they're using, they're putting 10, 20% down. What, you have any idea what kind of normal down payment or if they're paying above market price right now in any markets by any chance with, with what's going on? Yeah, there's lots of multiple offers going over asking, things like that. Uh, Most people, especially on their first one, are utilizing that 10% down vacation home loan. There are definitely some rules about that, that you need to talk to your loan officer, make sure you are very upfront about what you're doing. But the Fannie Freddie rules right now are that it has to be over 65 miles from your primary. You have to intend to stay there for two weeks out of the year, and you can't put any any type of contract on it that takes the control of it away from you, like a property management contract to a tenant. Other than that, uh, you can put it on Airbnb and Verbo when you're not using it for those two weeks of the year. So uh, a lot of people are doing those and you can have one of those per market. So that is a, a hack to scale quickly is that you can buy one in the Smokies for 10% and one in Florida for 10% and maybe one in Blue Ridge for 10%. So um, as long as it makes sense, you can't buy two in the same market. So not two in the Smokies, but as long as it's provable that they're different markets, like you probably cannot do Destin and Panama City Beach at 10% each because that doesn't make sense. So, you know, it's whatever the underwriters deem appropriate, but a lot of people do that to scale quickly. And they could go up to 10 10 or, or probably I guess nine if they have their primary could they do up to I guess eight or nine I guess like that they could if they're all in different markets yeah wow that is a pretty cool hack there and it's pretty cheap interest rate with the, the Fannie Freddie stuff huh yes yes and Fannie Freddie can only they only allow that up to the jumbo limit which is depending on the state a plus or minus 750 I did actually just start a mortgage company that is in Tennessee only right now. It'll be in Florida in about 30 days and then move out states from there. And we can do the 10% down up to 3 million. Wow. Yeah. 
That is really good. Cool. Now, have you seen any big funds? I mean, we had the uh, um, you know Black Knight came in and bought the big long-term rental portfolio. Have you, have you had any heard any whisperings about some of the bigger funds trying to get into the short-term game? I have heard some, and from what I've seen, they're doing mostly metro areas. I'm sure at some point they'll expand into the vacation markets, but haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. Now, with the short-term rentals, have you seen, uh, or you probably have some of your clients that are maybe around some of the larger universities out there for like football games or home games? Have you seen any of that taking place? Like, you know, we used to own some short-term rentals up in, in Notre Dame you know, in other areas like that are popular, but they're not the big Metroplex. South Bend, Indiana is not the biggest Metroplex, but it does have that kind of influx every week. Are you seeing some of that stuff happening? Uh, here and there. So I, at Texas, University of Texas is my alma mater, so they're not doing it there. That's right. You can't do it here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I also grew up in a big SEC football town in Starkville, Mississippi. Mississippi State is there, just won the uh, the baseball national championship yep, and even even little old Starkville doesn't is not happy about uh short-term rentals it's just those places that people live man they don't like them so uh and I don't blame them for that so um I know I know some people are doing pretty well around Tuscaloosa don't know how long that's gonna last either it's just depends on the city that's uh, where the University of Alabama is at for those that don't know. Oh yeah, sorry. I assume that because I grew up around here. But uh, yeah, that's where Alabama is. Now, have you been to, you mentioned Gulf Shores, beautiful area there, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, Jimmy Buffett's sister has that restaurant over there. Was Lulu's. it Lulu's? Yep. Exactly. Uh, or the hangout on the beach there oh, in the yep. big. <laughs> Florabama Shore. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Got to have a drink there, Bloody Mary in the morning if you can. Yep. Um, with that being so close to the beach and, and, and stuff like that, I mean, you've got, talk about some of the attractions. I mean, people besides people coming there and just hanging out at the beach, is that what you see is really being a major attraction for some of those Gulf Coast cities like that? Yeah, the Gulf Coast cities, everybody in the Southeast. And now we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing a lot of New York plates now, a lot of New Jersey plates. People have really discovered this area of Florida and then Alabama, which is just right over the line for those of you who aren't familiar. A beach in Alabama sounds ridiculous to somebody who's never been, but Gulf Shores and Orange Beach are really, really nice. And they're just over the Florida line. But um, it's not really a secret anymore. It's not just the Southeasterners. It's everybody is coming down to this part of Florida. It's not as crowded as, uh, you know, Sarasota, St. Pete, places like that. Um, so everybody's just coming to go to the beach. Everybody just wants to go hang out on the beach, lay there like a lizard for a few days before they go back to work. <laughs> is there a uh, distance from the beach inland, five miles, a mile, a block? What, what do you like to see prefer it does really well for you on those beach, you know, Florida communities? If it's a condo, it needs to be on the beach. If it's a single family, it needs to be walking distance or golf cart distance. So no, I mean, no more than a mile. Mm-hmm. Now, are you providing golf carts? <laughs> I, none of mine uh, need it. Mine are all walkable. What what I tell people to do is there are a lot of golf cart rental places around here. So I tell people to, if if their place does require one, to have it in their listing. Hey, if you want to rent a golf cart, call this place. They'll deliver it to the, the unit before you even get there. So then you're not having to deal with all the liabilities and things like that. Put it on the guest. That's a smart thing because uh, the last thing you want to do, oh, is have a golf cart and forget somebody forgot to plug it in or to have a gas for it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or they kill themselves on it. <laughs> exactly. Or I get run over there. <laughs> yeah. Get a DWI while driving a golf. We had somebody happen that once again a couple of weeks ago. It does happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, are, th are there any things that you do in follow up with your audience? I know that you, you may have, may not there, but to get people to leave reviews, because I think reviews are probably one of the, the biggest things that help you out there, correct? Is there anything that you do to help in, in instigate that, you know, leaving reminder cards in the places or follow up or what do you do to kind of increase that? We have an auto message that sends out. I know there's some people out there, especially the people who are newer to short-term rentals that think it's totally tacky to ask for a review. And it probably is in normal practice. Uh, but when you have a short-term rental, you really do have to say at the end, you know, hey, thanks so much for staying. Left you a five-star review because you review the guests too. So left you a five-star review. Hope you'll do the same. Thanks so much for coming. And just thank them for coming. And they'll typically, unless they're a Karen, they'll leave you a good review. Who's like, oh, okay. Let's <laughs> say that. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense there for you. Um, 
any anything else out there that uh, we haven't talked about that you think is good good counsel? Have got any questions from anybody out there? Anybody doing some short term rentals that are watching out there, either uh, on YouTube or listening on Clubhouse or here live on Zoom? Is there a, with the first time home buyers doing that? Do you see a price range? I mean, it obviously varies by market, but. You've seen an average 100, 150, something to get started, three, two, one. I mean, obviously, one ones, obviously, are like condos for the most part. But what do you see is kind yeah. of the bread butter starting point for people? The, the more bedrooms, the better. So get the most amount of bedrooms that you can get without it being, you know, like a 10 by 10 box with four bedrooms. Um, but the, the most bedrooms you can get, the better off you are. But I mean, I, if, you, if you're under 300, I would go, uh, I would definitely go the Disney market because the thing about the beach condos is they're all non-warrantable. So if you're trying to use that 10% down vacation home loan, a non-warrantable condo without going into a ton of detail just means it's a condo tell that nobody really lives there and the banks don't want to lend on that. So you have to get commercial financing, which means you can't do that 10% down. You have to do 20 to 25. So if you're going to put 25% down, you might as well go get a bigger single family and put 10 and that's how I feel anyway. No, so, um, yeah, so the condos, although in purchase price can be cheaper, they're actually more cash out of pocket in a lot of cases. So I would say, you know, under 300, I'd probably go Disney market, uh, but 500, you can get a good two, three bedroom, four bedroom in some cases in, eh, no, not four bedroom in some cases, two to three in the 500 range in most of the markets that we're in. Nice. Are you seeing anybody go on the tiny house route? Because we've seen that popping up in different places too. Oh, if I had a dollar for every time someone asked me to help them do a tiny house, I would have $1,000. So the thing with the tiny houses, there's a few things you have to keep in mind. Just because a piece of land is unrestricted, is zoned unrestricted, does not mean you can just go plop down a bunch of houses. You still have to. So I have one client who's doing this successfully. and uh, he's got, he's got like 80 million follow, followers on YouTube. I don't know a lot. Uh, his YouTube channel is at Rob built R O B U I L T. And he's the only person I've seen do it. He has 50 unrestricted acres and he's still having to put it out just as if it were a development. There's minimum square footage requirements. There's a lot of things. So a lot of people have this bright idea of they're going to go plop down all these like Mongolian yurts and all these other things and rent them separately, but that's just not the case. Another thing to think about with the tiny homes, if it has wheels, it's, it's a car. It's, it, you know, it's not going to appreciate. It is gonna be worth less every year. If it is a real house, even though it's tiny, that is real estate and that's going to appreciate and that is going to build your wealth. So if you're running around spending $150,000 on, gla $150, on glamping tents, I would encourage you not to do that and put that into an actual, no matter how small it is, piece of real estate rather than something that is worth nothing as the years go on. So nothing against tiny houses. Uh, I just think that a lot of people see stuff on HGTV and think, oh my gosh, that's really cute. I'm going to do this, but it's not really an investment strategy unless you do it a very specific way. Makes sense there. Now, being from Austin, we have the tiny, the community, you know, community first, which is the homeless community that they've done a really good job here with bed and loves, but they operate a 50 unit tiny house, kind of mm -hmm. Airbnb aspect out there for people comes down there. So the, I asked, and then of course we've got uh, down off of Zilker Park, we have all the airstreams that are operated as short-term rentals too, which is kind of an interesting aspect. Mm -hmm. But you're right; they're all plotted out properly. They've all got the development stuff going on it, and and going from there. So I just didn't know if you'd seen that in other places, but uh, oh, people yeah. ask about it all the time. <laughs> sure. Let's put let's put a let's build a tiny house on my uh, my trailer here real fast to start writing it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, good stuff there. Well. Avery, anything else you want to leave us with? Any uh, any uh, tips, advice, or the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, right on my website, theshorttermshop.com. Email's right there. Instagram, uh, mortgageshop.co is our new uh, in-house uh, mortgage company. I don't think the site's actually live yet, so you don't have to pull it up. But um, yeah, just hit us up. We'll help you however we can. Perfect. And I'm just sharing that with the screen right now. So right there, schedule a consultation right there. 
and then uh, you've got your join your, your Facebook group there for you too. These are are these oh man, this and uh, these all houses on your uh, Airbnb stuff. That's just a that's just the website theme. Okay. If you scroll down, there's some um, the actual listings. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, there we go. Smoky Mountains, Florida, Alabama. Nice. Yeah, there. I actually learned the hard way not to like advertise the ones that I own personally because like we had a guest who canceled outside the cancellation period and it she knew who we were. Like she was able to figure out who I was and who my husband was uh, outside of Airbnb and like went on my realtor Facebook page and left me this horrible review over something over the fact that she canceled outside her cancellation period and didn't get a, uh, a refund. So that's just a little tip to just maybe don't tell everybody who you are on Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little bit of an asset protection, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Now that are you, do you have to, I mean, obviously with the line card, but how are you, are you structuring these all through individual entities or one entity or several different entities per asset? So we have a several holding companies that have several these underneath them. So there are several layers uh, before you get to us personally, uh, if you're going to sue us. <laughs> so, uh, and we didn't actually do that until we had quite a few doors. So I know everybody's situation is different and I'm by no means giving any sort of legal or tax advice, but um, you definitely, I, I saw somebody the other day who posted on Facebook, he has like a, I think it might be a 15 bedroom property. And he posted a picture of him and his partners with their, a big sign with their LLC name draped over, over the, the porch and was posting it everywhere. Cause he's like, so proud of his property. And I'm like, Oh, you just told everybody exactly who to sue. But luckily we've had no yet. I haven't even heard of anybody. I personally know colleague or otherwise having an issue with that, but you you're protected, have plenty of insurance stuff. That brings me to another question. Somebody just mentioned that. Are you seeing a, a big dramatic insurance cost on that compared to traditional homeowner's insurance or is it not, not much? It's definitely more than traditional homeowner's insurance. Uh, we do a short-term rental specific policy. And then we also have an umbrella commercial policy over everything too. So the more insurance, the better. Mm -hmm. Is there a cost per square footage that you figured out maybe as far as uh, decorating wise for you or um, your know, cost for that? Because we had a, somebody asked a question, cost to decorate a house. Oh, that's actually a really good question. So in the markets that we're in, most everything comes furnished. So you really don't have to worry about an entire house, which is nice. Uh, other than Price Lab, what other software do you use? Your Porter is the other one that we use, which is the channel manager, which manages pretty much everything automates the letting the cleaners know that they need to come uh, brings our Airbnb dashboard all into one thing, Airbnb and VRBO all into one and um, just automates the whole process that there are a few it's so the software is called a channel management software. We use your Porter IGMS is another one smart BNB is another one there's a lot of them out there. Nice. Now have you heard of anybody renting a house and turning it into short term rentals and, ha and hacking it that way. I have heard of that. That can be a good way to get some income coming in, but that's creating a job for yourself. I'd, I would not substitute that for actually buying the properties and renting them. And, and you obviously want to make sure it's okay with the, uh, the, landlord, the, homeowner, yeah. right? the landlord on that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I would never allow that in any of my long terms. <laughs> Makes sense. And what was the name of the guy who does that? You mentioned the tiny houses, of Bob Builder. What was it? Again? Oh, his name is Rob Abasolo. Uh, his YouTube is at Rob Built. At Rob Built. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Avery, thank you so much for coming on Nut Camp and sharing your nuggets and expertise on this. This is always a joy, always interesting conversation, especially a hot topic these days, huh? <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for having me. No problem. Now, are you seeing a lot? Are you getting asked to speak a lot of times on different podcasts and stuff like that? You got a nice mic there, so you must be doing it quite a bit, huh? Yes. Well, we actually just launched our own podcast this week called The Short Term Show. There are three episodes live at the moment. We started with three, and then it'll be weekly from here on out every Friday. Nice. The subtle plug. I love it. Check it out, everybody. <laughs> Go leave her a five star Go review. Subscribe. subscribe. Exactly. Well, we'll make sure and, and post the link to you, or if you can email me. Uh, the stuff on that, I'll be glad to post that out uh, in the replays for everybody. Absolutely. Well. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Hey, that is going to wrap it up for this session here. Uh, Avery, you guys have a great, great week, uh, rest of your weekend. Big plans for Saturday, Sunday? No, not that I know of. We've got two little kids, a two-year-old and a nine-month-old, so we'll probably just be doing the best we can. <laughs> Congratulations. Good stuff there for you. All righty. All right, everybody. So that's going to wrap up for this session here on Note Camp. And uh, let's take a 10-minute uh, break, and uh, we'll be right back. <laughs>